Bailey's been fixing my junk that I break for a pretty good while. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> last week we started a series on warfare, spiritual warfare. And our focus word last week was to be aware. And, and the, I think the only point really we need to reiterate is spiritual warfare is not occasional, it's daily. We, we, we ought not. We ought to be aware that spiritual warfare is a condition that Christianity brings you into. You, you don't experience spiritual. Like I said last week, if you uh, when you say we are just under spiritual attack, you're you're actually saying I'm being spiritually my butt's been handed to me. Because when you realize you're under spiritual attack, if you don't realize it until the the butt kicking's taking place you're late i mean it because we are under the fact that you're a christian follower of christ jesus you have an enemy and he is a daily very consistent uh enemy and so today the word is to be alert and if there's one phrase you need to stick with you today is if you get alarmed you was not alert Because if you're alert, you don't get alarmed. And I'll, I'll get into that a little more. But Ephesians 6, 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. <clears throat> so what am I told to do? Put on. It says put on the whole armor. And, 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 and so that's something that we're told to do. And why should I do it? Why did he give us the instructions to put it on? so that you may be able to stand. Which should tell you, without a lot of digging, I ain't going to be able to stand if I ain't got it on. Well, I don't know about y'all, but but I've been doing this spiritual walk pretty pretty steady since, uh, in, since 1999. New Year's Eve in 1999, I decided I was so close to death and I'd been battling with staying clean and sober. and But New Year's Eve 1999, the devil had me so close to death that I literally went to a guy's house. And at 3 in the morning, he got in the front seat of my pickup, or 4 in the morning, I don't remember the exact time, but I told him one of us was going to die before the, morning, before the sun rises. Then I had a pistol in my lap. He said, I really, we both got kids. Why don't we just get out and whoop the snot out of each other? I'm glad one of us had a brain. And the reason I've never shared that, because uh, I wasn't playing. You don't talk about those things if you mean those things. You don't. The reason I'm sharing that now is because the schemes of the enemy is to kill, steal, and destroy. And you're only alarmed if you're not alert. Why I'm sharing this with you is because I'm not alarmed by much the devil and the schemes of the devil throw at us. Uh, because, <laughs> because I've been alarmed so many times getting where I'm at. I do, I'm, I'm more diligent to be alert. Uh, I don't mean I catch them. It don't mean I see it all the time. It don't mean I don't miss it. It don't mean I don't get alarmed. I do get alarmed still. But we have to become alert as we live, as we walk on this earth. We have to be alert. Alert don't mean the same thing as aware. Uh, alert... <sighs> I got it wrote down here somewhere in my good eyes hunting where I wrote that definition at. Alert is to be fully aware and attentive, to be wide awake, to be ready. That's what it means to be alert. And, and we, like Joe said, we live getting alert to weather advisories and making plans and, 
and preparing and, and we're not alert to the coming of the, of the second coming of the Lord. We're not alert, aware, uh, uh, very much uh, prepared. One of the hardest things, uh, and I've tried this whole armor thing, and I'm, I've never been successful at it. I've tried that, I've, I've tried that, and I've thought, I don't understand, because I always end up forgetting something. Anybody else? Like, I may put on the helmet of salvation. I know I'm saved. I know I'm born again. You can't take that from me. I know what Jesus Christ did for me, but I have a tendency to forget to, the shield of faith. Anybody else? You, 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 oh, I, he says put on the whole armor. And so I, 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 I have never understood what this meant. And if Amy Joe hadn't have sent me a link to a real Bible teacher, I still wouldn't know today. But I listened to this guy teach on this whole armor that Amy Joe sent to me this week about six or seven times, and it finally makes sense. And so I hope we get this understood today, that if you look in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. All right, so spiritual blessings, what he's actually referring to is saving gifts of God given to you by the Holy Spirit. And so listen, and remember, Ephesians is broke down in three phases. The first phase is one through three, chapters one through three. It tells us what we received in Christ. Chapters four and five tell us how to live in Christ. Chapter six, Paul said, finally, I'm going to tell you about the fight, the battle that you will experience and how to win it in Christ. So why is it as soon as we read that uh, in verse 10 of chapter 6, before we get to verse 11, we quit thinking spiritually and we start thinking physically. Because of that two words, put on. We have only experienced putting on in the physical realm. We get up, we put on clothes. We get up, we put on another jacket today. We right. You put on a toboggan. You put on, you put on. So you, when you read that, you think physically. And they've actually been people teach physically that every morning you should, uh, in your mind, put on the helmet of salvation. In your mind. Well, let me ask you something. When it came to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were threatened with the thermos, uh, with the uh, thermos. <laughs> What's that thing? Furnace. With the furnace. Did they say, time out, I got to make sure I got the shield of faith? Right? No, what did they do? They had faith. Therefore, the shield was in place, and they walked through the fire. When it came to Daniel being thrown in the lion's den, did he say, wait a minute, i got to put on the shoes of salvation to know that I'm saved? No. He was cast into the lion's den in faith, believing, trusting in God's provisions and protections. Therefore, he was protected. When it came to David standing and confronting Goliath, did he? And he tried on Saul's armor. He said, "This don't work." So, what did what did what was David's declaration when he faced off with the giant? He said, "You come at me with sword and with javelin, but I come at you in the name of the Most High God." And he took a rock and killed him, or slung him. And here's another thing: I, uh, m m m you're not taught in. He didn't kill him with the rock. <laughs> he knocked him out, but that sucker cut his head off. That's what I like. It's like, yeah. Listen, that's spiritual warfare. And David kept it spiritual. You come at me in the name. You come at me in this and in that and that. Everyone else in the Israelite army was alarmed when, when Goliath walked out and and done all this trash talking. And, and why was David not alarmed? Because David was alert. David said, you've delivered me. My, my God has delivered me from the mouth of the lion and the mouth of the bear. And he, the same way he delivered me from that, he'll deliver me from you. Right? That's why I shared with y'all the day I decided I must learn to live spiritually because physically I'm, about, I'm, I'm too close to dying was New Year's Eve, 1999. Because I know who delivered me from that dark night. And that dark, <laughs> disgusting desire. I know who did that. And it wasn't Dr. Phil. 
and it wasn't the right song on the radio, and it wasn't my wife. It was the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of God that was in that pickup with me and that other man. I am not at all proud of any of that. But I am aware and I am alert to the schemes of the enemy because I have surrendered to them. I have fallen prey to them. I have, his strategies have worked on me. But not for God, I would not be here today. If not for God, we wouldn't be here today. But we gotta, we gotta, we gotta quit being alarmed and become more alert. If Ephesians 1 tells us we have received all the spiritual gifts, you ain't got to do nothing to have the whole armor except live the whole armor. He says. I'm not going to get into all of this because this is later, but he says, uh, uh, he goes on there, look over at verse, verse 14. He says, uh, stand and having done all, stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. So, so you don't put on a belt so that you know the truth. You walk in no truth so that you got a belt. That's what that means. That means the truth keeps all your stuff girded up and ready to move. I live in truth. I hate lies. John 8, 44 says that the, the, the Pharisees speak their native tongue. They speak the tongue of their father, who is a liar and the father of all lies. His name is the devil. So am I alarmed whenever folks tell lies on me or on our church? No, because I am alert. That's what the devil does. That's what he's always done. I know the truth. I know the truth. And so I'm girded up and ready because I know the truth. If, if uh, it, 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 I was texting and, 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 and communicating with James Boone, uh, and James was like, man, I, what I do know about spiritual warfare is when I'm not in the word and I'm not studying and grounded in the truth, I fall prey to his strategies real quickly I said yes amen I do the same thing and so do you because you ain't got the armor on if you ain't in the truth if you ain't living in truth if you ain't studying the truth if you ain't speaking truth you keep lying you won't never have your belt and I know y'all are thinking we're in church nobody in church lies Pfft, that's a lie these folks been lying and I'm sick of it there ain't an elder one told anybody not to talk or say anything about their business. We don't care what you say, and I'm sick of the line. Silence the devil and shame him. Speak truth. Speak truth, guys. We cannot live in fear, or, or we cannot be ready and aware and alert of the fears and the schemes of the enemy if we're not living in truth, if we're not girded up. And we're girded up, not because we put on a belt, but because we know the truth, we live the truth. Uh, he says, he goes on to stay, he says, uh, uh, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Listen, there's another scripture that Paul wrote that says, there's none righteous, no, not one. Well, righteousness is how you have the breastplate. Righteousness, living in righteousness, is what furnishes you the breastplate. If you're living in righteousness, you ain't got it. You're covered. You don't put it on to be righteous. There's none not righteous. No, not one. Who and how are we righteous? Says scripture says, for we are the righteousness of Christ. Right? In Jesus, you are made righteous. Therefore, you are only righteous in Jesus. And in Jesus, because of his righteousness, you have the breastplate of righteousness. The moment you start deciding and discerning, I got to put it on, you went from a faith 
grace-based salvation to a works-based salvation. I got to remember to put them boots on, them boots of salvation. I got to remember to put the, the that shield. I got to, people say, man, that, that old devil's shooting them darts, and I got to make sure I have the shield of faith. Well, you already lost, because it's up to you to have the shield of faith. The fact of the matter is, if you are walking by faith and not by fear, the shield is in place. Therefore, you don't experience the fire. You don't. Jesus done it all. For it should have been 47 people said amen, and it was one. Because of his death and his resurrection, he sits on the throne at high, and everything that he has access to, he provides to us. So why is it we are alarmed and not alert? Why is it we have spiritual warfare and we are getting our butts kicked because we're not have on the whole armor of God? And it ain't requiring you to get dressed and put it on. It's requiring you to be obedient and, and, and in submission to what he has done so that you have it on. Does that make sense? Can I move on? Because there's a lot more to do. But if we don't get that, we're, listen, you're gonna, I've been frustrated because I'm like, gosh, I keep forgetting to put it on. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, it ain't up to me to put it on. It's up to me to remain righteousness in Christ. It's up to me to walk by faith and not by sight. It's up to me to go, I'm in, I'm in Jesus. Look what he said. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. The, that's verse 10. In verse 11, we get out of him immediately because it says put on. And our brain is a physical put owner, not a spiritual. Listen, this is key. Everything I'm talking about is spiritual. The moment you were born again, given the spirit of God, you become a spiritual being. So everything you deal with is spiritual. This is a spiritual fight. We are struggling against spiritual forces. <laughs> And we have spiritual furnishings. Don't put on physical. Physical furnishings never sustain you in a spiritual force, ever. So put them on like he said. One of the things I'm going to share uh, in more detail on Wednesday nights, starting this next Wednesday, is a, is a uh, deal that happened at the Dollar General in Midland, Texas. It, Thanksgiving Day, we were taking McCray and my son-in-law to a hunt. And we stopped by there to buy all the junk food and candy we wanted. And and in that Dollar General, there's 20 people or so. All of a sudden, up there toward the front, uh, a, a lady got pretty loud. And then she got really hateful. I don't mean kind of. I'm talking about loud and hateful and cussing that poor lady that was running the register. And I was alarmed. I was taking, listen, I, here's how you know if you're alarmed. When you're in a situation and your your desire is to flee, you are alarmed. That's what alarms do. They make you want to get away. Fire alarm goes off, you think evacuate, right? Winter storm war, w w w warning comes on, you think go back in the house and stay by the fire. I was alarmed. I wanted to get away. I, I, I grabbed my cray, and I'm like, come here, bud. Get over here, bud. Get over here. So I, I'm like, man, let, 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 let's talk about these chips right here. Because she's cussing and, 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 and listen, I, remember another way you know that a spiritual force is at hand is it's not natural. It, it, I looked around and everybody in that Dollar General was standing at the end of the aisles and at the front of the store captivated. I'm talking about nobody was moving, nobody was talking, but one woman. And I went, whoa, she's got everybody. She, she has control of everything. That ain't natural. I'm like, oh, I'm alarmed. I want, to, I, I want to push the buggy full of candies back out of the way, and I want to get my grandson. I want to go with the truck. Because I'm like, oh. <laughs> and, then, and, then I, and, then I, and then I'm like, I, I'm, just, I'm finna just tell her to shut up. And I'm like, I got McCray here, and she ain't scared. She could whoop me. So another word that you need to know in spiritual warfare is to be aware. <laughs> I'm aware that this woman, woo. And I didn't know what to do. Why did I not know what to do? 
because I was not alert, I was alarmed. You know when it hit me what I should have done? When I got on I-20 and I got about 40 miles from Midland, I went, oh, my God. She made that poor lady unbag everything and recheck everything because she knew she doubled something. She cussed her for being Hispanic. She cussed her for being a woman. She cussed her for being stupid. And all of us stood there alarmed because this was not a normal mad. This was not a normal agitated. This was evil. And it wasn't the woman's fault that was checking out, and it wasn't the woman's fault that was cussing out because it is a spiritual power. It is a spiritual force. And as I'm driving down I-20, ashamed of myself, like, why? How long do you have to do this stuff before you be a man about it? Before you have confidence to walk with the shield of faith, to walk up there and say, hey, ma'am, what I should have done, what the Lord told me, why didn't you pay for her bill? Because a dollar and 20 cent double beep beep wouldn't matter to me in the least. I spent 60 on candy bars. So, so why didn't I just go up and say, hey, you don't have to redo that. Let me just buy your whole bill, right? Let me just... Let us just pay for that. And, and you don't worry about redoing it. You just go and have a Thanksgiving day. Whew. Why did I not do that? Because I was not alert. I was alarmed. And so I, I failed. I, I failed spiritual warfare. And, and I'm sick of that. I'm sick of me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, and I'm tired of the devil winning. And I'm tired of just preaching about it. I'm sick of just preaching about it. I, 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 that's when I could have won one for the kingdom. I don't know about y'all, but I never, I never, I never change. My life never changes because of victories. It's my failures that make me change. It's my failures that says I'll never. Do. It's, it's that morning, in 1999. I, I will never be that guy again. If you ain't ready, you're late. If you're not aware, if you're not alert, you're gonna get alarmed. And so we gotta grasp. It says he says. Then he says. He says uh, uh, to 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 stand against the schemes. Of the enemy. That word schemes is actually better translated as strategies. Schemes are plans to outwit an opponent, and that's what the devil does. And that's what they've been doing for decades. They, they, they strategize. The prince of the air is what he's called in the, in the scriptures. Prince of the air. So to listen, he has authority on this earth. He has power. He has influence. Now, he's been defeated. And we defeat him in Jesus. But don't fool yourself and think you can defeat him outside of Jesus. It is in Jesus, by the power of Jesus and the resurrected gift that, that, that powered him back to life that indwells us, which is known as the Holy Spirit, that defeats him. How, how well does the devil and his army, and he is an army, it is a very well organized unit, and he 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 has strategies. He has strategized and been aware of my family for decades. He knows your very weakness, and he strategizes, and he schemes, and he waits so that in that weakness, he can give you temptation. That is what he uses. Go back to Matthew 4. I'm not going to read it because I don't have time, but Jesus, before he began his earthly ministry, went into the wilderness, led by the Spirit. After 40 days of fasting, he was tempted by the devil. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. 
God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability, but with that temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Listen, that, that verse has been mistranslated in so many lives. Because so many people say God won't let you be tempted by more than you can bear. God won't put on you more than you can bear. That's not at all what that says. Listen, there's another scripture that says that God tempts no man. Let no one say God is tempting me, for God tempts no man. So when you, when you make that verse say God won't let nothing be on me more than I can bear, you just totally wiped out truth. And your garments ain't wrapped around you, and you're not ready for nothing because you're not knowing, speaking, or living the truth. It's probably me, Jay. The temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but will provide the way of escape. So can you be tempted more than you're able? You dead gum right. But he's always faithful to give you a way out. And in spiritual warfare, the devil's strategies is to tempt you and to tempt you beyond what you can bear so that you will fall to that temptation. And in so, in doing so, no longer live in the full armor. Temptation, listen, you cannot claim, I don't care how you do it, I don't care how long you look in the mirror, uh, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, uh, knowingly, willingly, com continuously living in sin. Because <laughs> you ain't. Now, I didn't say you won't commit sin. There's a big difference in being righteous in Christ and sinning and living in sin claiming to have righteousness. That one's a liar and the other one's human. And if you ain't sure which one you are, there's a good chance you're living lying. Because I know I am the righteousness of Christ, even though I fail and I sin. But I don't live in that sin. I recognize it. I, 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 if I've done it to somebody, I say, man, I was wrong. I've sinned. I want you to forgive me. I move on. I cut Mickey's finger the other day, and I had to ask him twice to forgive me because I didn't mean to do it, but I cut the snot out of him. You know what I'm saying? We was castrating calves, and he, he needed to hold the tail, and he was late getting there. So when he went to get the tail, it done slapped me three times. I had cow manure in my eye. So when I handed him the tail, I had the knife in the, I had the knife in the, into the tail. When he grabbed the tail, he grabbed the knife. Yeah. I said, well, you need to pay attention to what you're grabbing. That's what I said, okay? And then I went, Mickey, that's wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me for being so hateful? I was fell into temptation because I was irritated by the slap in the face. Anyway, that ain't got nothing to do with the day. 1 John 4, 1 through 6, write that down. You need to study it. It says test every spirit. You better test them. You better test the spirits. Beloved, do not be deceived. Every spirit, but do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God or from many false prophets have gone out into this world. By this you know that the spirit of God is the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This spirit, of the, it is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world. He's among us. And I, I, listen, don't be deceived. These walls don't hold him out. It says, uh, you are from, uh, I don't remember where I left off. Little children, you are from God. You have overcome them for he who is in you. So how do you overcome them? Him in you is the power. But you don't have the power released through you unless you're in him. Him in you and you in him becomes an unbeatable, undefeatable force to be reckoned with. The moment you're out of him, you've, you've stepped out of the full armor. Does that make sense? The moment you're being tempted, you need to realize something. That is the beginnings of you falling prey to the spiritual warfare that's at hand. Temptation should not surprise any of us. 
because it surprises us and we become alarmed by it when we're not alert and aware. So be aware and alert. Uh, this last weekend, my wife, last Sunday morning, my, my mother-in-law fell and broke her leg in a couple of places and some ribs, and, and she was in the hospital in Texarkana while we were having church. And uh, my wife's nervous about her mom, what kind of shape she's in, uh, how is she. And anyway, uh, when church was over, you know, we get with them and check on them. They have surgery Tuesday, so we're up there all day Tuesday doing surgery. And I was praying Tuesday because Grandma's having surgery and you're in a hospital room. You know I mean? You're in a hospital on the surgery floor where everybody in there has got family having work done so I was just in prayer and then and I got restless because I can't sit very long and I get to moving around and then I, I run into a couple that's on the second floor and I help them in their wheelchair move them around and I got to pray with them you know and and uh, they were confusing that hospital was pretty confusing on directions and by the time I'd been there you know four five hours I, I, I was navigating folks you know so I was wheeling them around or taking them here showing them how to get there and and just because I got to do something and, and and every one of them I was interacting with you know what I, I was encouraging them I was alert. And so when this lady walked by me carrying a bag and a pillow and a blanket and, and, and she, she was an elderly lady make, making the fastest tracks she could make and they weren't really, really fast, but she was hustling and, and she went by me and I said, ma'am, you want me to carry that bag? She never looked at me. She dropped the bag and said, yes, and kept right on walking. <laughs> I scooped up the bag and I had to hustle. She not one time looked at me. We get all the way to her car. She opens the back door, moves something over, said, put it there. She put stuff in the front car. She shut the door. She said, been here eight days. Now they're dismissing us, and they told us to hurry. She never looks at me. She never said thank you. She turned around, headed back to the, to the hospital, just like this right here, and I'm right behind her. I don't know why I'm in a hurry. I'm not going home with them, but I'm in a hurry now, too. I'm, I'm right with her. We, we, I said, ma'am, do you need me to help you carry anything else? I mean, I'm, I'm here the rest of the day services are free i'll help you what, what, what can i you know let me she said i've got it i've got everything she said they're transporting him back by ambulance any y'all ever had that that's not a good sign <laughs> i went mm. she got on the elevator i got on the elevator i got no reason for being on the elevator she punched the sixth floor or whatever floor it was six or i can't remember when that elevator started up, this lady still ain't looked at me. And I said, you mind if I pray? She turned and looked right in my eye. She said, I would much appreciate it. And so I went to praying, nothing fancy, just simple old stupid me praying. And the elevator doors opened, and we didn't get off the elevator. We kept praying. The elevator door started to close. Somebody stuck her arm in there and stopped it. It opened back up. Y'all been there. And when I said amen, I looked up, and there's four people standing outside the elevator praying with the two of us that was in the elevator, and one of them would just stick their hand out every now and then to keep the elevator from, they didn't want the prayer chain to be broke. See, they kept it going. So why am I telling you all this? Because I was alert. I was alert, right? So we finally get Grandma out of surgery. We move Grandma to her room, uh, and, and we're sitting there, and I'm out of the way. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, don't like, I don't like all that. I'm, I'm and and. This old man gets up, and he don't know he's got a catheter in, and he needs to pee, and he's cussed every, I mean, he is having a fit in the next room over, you know. And I'm like, oh, man, this dude, oh, man, he ought not say that. Uh -huh. I start praying for him, and I hear him ask for some fruit. I mean, it's 9 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, and this man's wanting some fruit. Well, his nurse finally gets him to realize he can pee. He don't have to do nothing, and please don't pull that out. But he's mad. She come out of there. I said, ma'am, can I get him some fruit? She said, well, there ain't nowhere to get no fruit. To, I mean, everything's closed. But she pulled up his chart and said, well, he can eat. But I don't know where you're going to find no fruit. I said, I found a vending machine that's got cups of fruit in it, $4.25. So I went and fetched me a cup of fruit. I come back in there, and I opened that door, and I said, hey, Grandpa. <laughs> what? what he said i said how about a cup of fruit hell yeah i said well let me give you a cup of fruit pitch dark i mean there ain't a light i can't see him you hear me i can't see him and i ain't gonna say exactly how he said it i done said hell that's probably gonna get me enough trouble 
turn on the light, right? I turn on the light, listen to me. This sucker look like Charles Manson. I don't mean kind of. I like to drop the cup of fruit. I, 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 listen, I, w I almost got alarmed. And I said, hey, man, here's you some fruit. I, I actually shook enough I dropped two grapes out of the cup. Pick them back up and put them in there. I picked, they hit the bed. They didn't hit the floor. Put them out. I said, here, here, here's your, here's your cup of fruit, cup of fruit. Here's your cup of fruit. There's a kid. There's a, a guy sitting, about a 20-some-odd-year-old sitting back here, and he's just there to maintain some peace, right? I didn't know he was in there. I'm glad he was there. And I told Grandpa, I said, Grandpa, you know you stuck here. They don't need being mad about it. I, 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 I. I said, look at me. He looked at me and I said, do you know Jesus Christ? Yes. I said, do you know he loves you? Do you know that he wants you to know and never forget how much he loves you? He said, I know he does. I said, will you let me pray with you? I wish you would. And so I prayed with Grandpa. And when I walked out, a lady was standing right there and she grabbed me by the arm. They're in the very next room. She said, when he went to cussing and throwing, I thought somebody ought to do something nice for that poor man. I'm so glad you did what the Lord wanted. I'm so glad you did what the Lord would want. And I'm like, I don't know about that. I was just getting a cup of fruit. But as I drove home, I was just praying and praying for him, and I was praying for Grandma because she's stuck right next door to him, right? And gosh, a mighty hospitals are miserable anyway. When you got a mad grandpa with a decatheter trying to rip it out so he can pee right next door, it's a problem. And poor grandma just had major leg surgery. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just thinking and praying, and then it hit me. It hit me. The whole reason grandpa was two rows over from grandma was, was so that I wouldn't be alarmed this time. I would be alert, and I would hear him say, he wanted some fruit, not be so mad at him or disgusted by his vulgarities or irritated by his inconsiderations. And I was able to give a kind gesture, right, what I failed to do at the Midland Dollar General Store. Are y'all following me? And I had a sister that happened to be in the next room over that said, thank you for doing what our Lord would have you to do. Listen, if we just do those simple things, we, we, we will change our country. We will change everything about us. We, we will change our church. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with, with this, and I've been praying, and I don't know how to say this without just saying it. And honey, don't, don't be mad, mad at me. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says, Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure... Hold on a minute. He has caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, <coughs> I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So what's Paul talking about? How does Satan outwit us? How do we fall to the schemes of Satan by being outwitted, by not forgiven? And Paul is talking to the church, period. And Paul is talking about the church having been put through something by somebody. And Paul is talking about a church that is angry, frustrated with an individual or with somebody within their own church body. And Paul's like, listen, I have forgiven him. Shut up and forgive him. This scripture has come up to me three times this week. Proverbs 19.3. I actually had it in my notes and I took it out. Then it was in the box that's in here. 
Proverbs 19, 3 says, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and, they're, and they are angry at the Lord. I had it texted to me earlier this week. I said, yeah, or we give the devil credit. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they're angry at the Lord. Then she wrote at the bottom of her note, when you ask for forgiveness, your sins are removed as far as east is from the west, and your consequences, but the consequences are not removed. Dang, that step's gone. God loves you. She signed her name. Last week, there was another card left in my box. And the only thing they wrote on that card was resign. I don't read my box. I don't get in my box. This is what the person, this is what, this is spiritual warfare. I was not alarmed. I'm alert. I am not uh, offended. I'm aware. Do you know who got that card out of my box? My sweet wife. The reason she gets stuff out of that box is because that box has usually only got cards that the funeral homes send after we do funerals. And what she does is she takes those cards and she mails those families comfort cards. And the reason I don't get in that box anymore is because I, I kept forgetting to give her those cards. And she'd be like, did you, I know you did two funerals this week. I need those cards. I want, I want those addresses. I, shoot, babe, they're in my truck or they're, so she, I just, I haven't gotten anything out of my box for three years. But the person who put the word resign in my box, they're not aware of that. They have no idea. Who does? The devil. He knows. And listen, he also knows there is nothing any of you can say to me that'll make me not be obedient to where God has me. I, I, listen, I'm not, this is not a good thing. All my life I cared and tried to please one man, and I never got it done. And when he died, November the 19th of 2007, I was released from trying to please people. And so the fact that people here want me to resign or somebody, or I, listen, I'm not mad at all. I agree 100%. I resigned January 2023. I'm in complete agreement with you. God didn't do that. So listen, I'm, I don't want anybody to be offended or mad or upset or anything. I want you to be alert because the devil knows I don't check that box. He knows my wife does. And the devil knows my wife has battled with the root of rejection that has tormented her all of her life. And the devil knows if you hurt my wife, I will forget I'm a son of the most high God and I will try to take you out. But I'm not alarmed. <laughs> I'm alert. And when my wife did not tell me for three days why she was so upset, and we pulled up in the parking lot Wednesday night, she said, I just don't want to get out. I said, why, babe? We got a counseling to do. I don't want to get out. I said, we got to get out. <laughs> then she told me, I don't want to get out because of this. And I don't want, I just, and what she's afraid of being rejected. I've been rejected by her multiple times. It does not bother me. What does bother me is to see my wife hurt. Listen, that's the schemes of the enemy. That's the strategies. He's watching. He's aware. He is alert, and he knows how to get to you. I know I'm running late, but we need to stop this. It needs to end because what Paul said was it has been forgiven. And listen, here's what else happened to me. Friday night, I felt bad for my dog, and my wife said, you need to do something. You know, your dog's in that kennel. It's not all that warm. So I took my best dog, cowboy, my good dog. I put him in the tack room with a heater. And I'm not a big pet man. I mean, you know, I mean, I got up Saturday morning, and cowboy had got to playing, and he demolished my tack room. I was so mad at that sucker. He got underneath the cabinet. He busted a water line. I walk in there. I ain't got no froze lines. I got a flood throughout the floor of my tack room. Crap scattered all over the place. He made me so mad I kicked him out. Griped at him. You stupid idiot. Then I worked him a little bit Saturday. We moved some cattle around. 
Saturday evening, I said, you ain't going back inside. Punk, you don't deserve it. So I moved him a doghouse right there on the porch of the, of the, of the, of the tack room. And I put a couple of horse blankets, old horse blankets in it. And I put him on a chain so that he could, you know, he, he's plowed out of the wind. And, and that's, that's plenty good enough. He's a dog. Stupid for putting him in the tack room. Right? He's a dog. I'm not talking to y'all. I'm talking to a man that got dogs. I'm talking to another man like me. But I got out there this morning. Cowboy was laying out. And I scooped him up. And I carried him back in the tack room. And he's still. He's barely quivering. And then it hit me. Somebody got in that rat poison underneath that sink. So I'll go home and bury a good dog. Listen to the Lord perform his miracles. Had I known he had that poison in him, all you got to do is give him hydrogen peroxide. That's all you got to do. All I had to do, if I'd have known, if I'd have just known, I'd have shot him with about 10 cc's down his throat of hydrogen peroxide. He'd have blowed up and puked everything everywhere, but it all got out of his system. But I didn't know. I put it there. I put that rat poison under them sinks. You got a tack room and feed, you better have it out. They don't, but I put it under the sink where nobody would, because I've lost a dog already once to rat poison. But I didn't know he got in that. Listen, we all make mistakes. We all make messes. But it's the poison that kills you. That's unforgiveness. I appreciate that you don't like me as your preacher, whoever you are, however many, I don't care how many there is. I understand I don't like me as a preacher. I'm not that guy. I'm not here because I want to be. No elder serves in this church family because they want to be an elder. It is a position that God has prepared and put us into. No team leader who will be meeting here in a minute, they're not leaders because they need a tag or a position of authority. They're just trying to do their part and advance God's kingdom. No team member, no team does anything because they want to be a butthole about nothing. They're just trying to do what we can do. And you know what? Some of us are like dogs, and we make a dang mess. Or we get our butts in something and we don't know what not got into. But your unforgiveness, that's the poison. And I'll bury a good dog, but I am not ready to bury a church. I told my wife Wednesday night, I said, baby, we're going in there. Because God ain't told us we had to leave yet. She told me what that note said. I kind of chuckled. I said, well, I'll not be surprised. Crap, I don't want to be our preacher either. That, don't, that ain't what hurts her. What hurts her is somebody that she cares and loves. A family would like to see her gone. Because if you want me gone, she's got to go too. And y'all are stuck. You're stuck. Listen, listen, you're stuck. We're stuck. Why? So ask yourself, why are we stuck? Because it ain't about you and it ain't about me. It ain't about what you want. It ain't about what I want. It ain't about what's best for you. It ain't about what's best for me. It is the fact that all of us together are insignificant and insufficient, but in Jesus and in the power and the might and the greatness of Jesus Christ, we become one, and he gets all the glory, and we advance his kingdom. The poison that'll kill this church is unforgiveness. So you can either forgive us, forgive me. And my brother's told me he's sick and tired of me taking the blame for everything that went wrong in 2023. I don't know how else to do it. And I don't need no pity. I am the leader of this church. It is my responsibility and I will give an account for every decision I've made, the elders have made, the lay pastors have made, and the, the, the leadership, the team members have made, I will stand before the Lord. 
And I understand that. And I got one thing to say. Whether you like me or you don't, it's fine with me. My wife will never check that box again, so put whatever you want in it. I'll check it when I want to. What I want to say is, we know there's poison. And the poison gets stopped today. Not because of me. Not <laughs> because of him. And it's forgiveness. It's forg I'm not ready to bury a church. And everybody has a right, man. Look, everybody has a right. I'm sorry I've took too long. But I've been sick long enough. I, I, listen, I will fail you again. I'm just a dog. You put me in a spot I'm not supposed to be in or I'm not comfortable in. I'm going to bust a water line. I'm just a dumb dog. I will get into rat bait occasionally. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, it's, I'm just a guy. Gary Kelly, you asked me two times, who's our leader? Jesus Christ is our leader. He is the head of the church. We are the body. We follow him. We follow the Lord. Amen? Just, just do each other. <laughs> Beasley said when families get into it, they end up coming back together stronger. Let me pray. Let me pray. Now, now, each one of you have a decision to make. And, you, and I remind you that, that uh, as Christ Jesus, your Lord and Savior, you are a follower of Christ. <sighs> Lord, help me. I, I don't know. I, I want all y'all to know I love you. I, I, don't, I don't have to like you, and you don't have to like me. <laughs> I mean, we, this church ain't never been built on liking. I mean, we didn't like each other when we started pouring the concrete. We ain't, I mean, have we, Todsey? It, it's not about liking. It's, we are loved by the Father. And we are surviving by the power of Jesus Christ. And we're going to thrive. And we're going to unite. There's but one thing worth dying for, and that's unity. And we will unify. And the only way we unify is through forgiveness of love, forgiveness. Uh, I will not ask you to forgive me again. I will tell you this. If you can't forgive me, get up and get out. I am stuck being your pastor, but you ain't stuck staying with a pastor. A pastor is called, and he is not. if he's not released, he cannot remove. I'm sorry. And you have every right to change churches. You probably changed one when you came here. Because I can promise you, it wasn't a lost hellion that left that. They walk up to you. The unchurched, they walk up to you and say, you stink as a preacher and you ought to quit. Them's my people. Church people leave notes. So I encourage you to trust the Lord with what he's going to do with us. Trust the Lord and get the poison out of this body. The next person that walks up to you wanting to muddle and murmur and whine about this or that, hush them because you're just as guilty. We won't never advance the kingdom and minister to this community if we can't get past each other. Father, I thank you for this day, and I pray and I ask blessings, and I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be aware, to be alert to the condition that we're in. There ain't nothing wrong with being in bad shape. There ain't nothing wrong with being in, in critical condition. It's just really, really bad if you don't know you're in it. And, Lord, I am not afraid. I am not alarmed. I am not running. I am not attacking, and I'm not retreating. I'm standing firm. And anybody and everybody that is in agreement with me will stand right now, standing firm under the, in the power of Jesus Christ, standing in his name, that we will unite as a family. We will walk forward in forgiveness that we all need. Lord, that we will unify so that we can be better as one. You are the head of our church. You are the head of our family. You are leading us toward Christ's likeness. You're leading us to advance your kingdom. You're leading us to confront uh, the war, the spiritual battles, the struggles that not only us as a church, but our nation and people within our communities are faced with every day. 
Every day they face with these spiritual demons and these battles that just defeat them and, and want to make them just go back in a hole. Lord, I'm so thankful that your power and the power of Christ Jesus is truly greater than the powers that is on this earth. I am truly thankful that in you, I know I have the entire full armor of Jesus. And Lord, I don't have to put it on. It's not a requirement for me to make sure I do it. It's a requirement that you have provided in Jesus' name. And so whether it's the dungeons, uh, the fiery furnace, the, the, the lion's den, or the murmuring lies, in the name of Jesus, I'm not a bit aware, uh, uh, alarmed. Our church is not afraid. We're not panicking. We're standing firm because we have the armor of Jesus Christ. Lord, we walk in the truth and we rebuke lies. We silence the enemy and his strategies and schemes. Lord, I have the position as the leader and pastor of this body. And so because of that position, not because of me, but because of the position that you have given me, I have an authority to speak into the darkness and to speak life. And I speak life on this body today. I speak and rebuke and renounce the demonic schemes of the devil. I silence the devil by the authority of Jesus Christ. And everyone that lies and speaks lies in the name of the liar, I rebuke and silence them. I ask for forgiveness from one and all. I pray and thank you for giving the forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you heal everyone that's hurt, offended. I pray, Lord, if there's anything, any and any one of us can do as your servants, Lord, we're all just your children. Let us be used to be a source of healing love. Let us be a word of encouragement. Let us unite and stop dividing. Let us advance your kingdom and not our own agendas. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen.